Uh, hello again, everybody. This is Steve. Um, this is going to be a very important video, and it's going to be a little complicated. I really wish I had the communication skills that my friend Brandon, the big sib, has for this one, because I don't want to make this seem like a message of doom and gloom, and... I don't want to discourage anybody. It's actually meant to encourage. But we've got to get to the bottom of what's going on and why it's going on. And the understanding that the only remedy is from the Most High, Yahuwah Elohim. So, with that said, I've got to be the one to tell you that you're an enemy of the United States Incorporated. And this is going to be quite convoluted, so I'm going to do a slideshow. It's going to be an overview, and then we're going to go look at a document that I mentioned in the slideshow. And I'm going to give you a couple of other things that are outside of that document that you really need to know. <coughs> Excuse me. The laws of man have superseded the laws of Elohim in their application in this world. No, they've not superseded the laws of Elohim, just as their application in this world. Ultimately, he is the creator of all who is. He is the only lawgiver. But we have this legal system that is so convoluted and so confusing. And I'm trying to give this to you in a way that you don't have to understand all this stuff. You just have to understand some key points. And hopefully, that will prod you in the direction of seeking the help of the Most High and seeking a relationship with Him throughout this whole thing. Like I said, this has been one of the most, the hardest ones that I've done as far as the research this morning. Things that I knew um, as I dug into them deeper and I strung them together in a way that I really never have before. Um, it was an eye opener for me. And if you know you pay attention, I think this will be an eye opener for you. And I'm going to tell you why you're an enemy of the United States and why this has to end bad. This is from the Hague Convention. It's Article 55. The occupying state shall only be regarded as administrator and usufructory of the public buildings, real property, forests, and agricultural works belonging to the hostile state and situated, situated in the occupied country. It must protect the capital of these properties and administer it according to the rules of usufruct. Now we're going to forget about this for a minute, and we're going to go some stuff and through some stuff, and then we're going to go look at these rules of usufruct, because that's a key, a key word that you really need to understand. And this is why the United States will never cease hostilities towards the people. It all has to do with usufruct. They have to collapse this thing. They have no choice. And you'll see that when we get to this part of it. So how can this be? The Trading with the Enemies Act, 1917 and revised in 1933, is the key to understanding this. Now, the Hague Convention, the Geneva Convention, uh, the Libra Codes, it all kind of starts with the Libra Codes. But Brandon's I handled the Libra Codes pretty well, and... Um, and showing you some things there. I highly suggest that you, if, you, if you're not already subscribed to the Big Sibs YouTube channel, that you subscribe. He's much better at this than I am as far as, as breaking it down and making it understandable. Now, we're going to go and we're going to see a special report on the national emergency in the United States of America by Dr. Eugene Schroeder. And this really breaks down the Trading with the Enemies Act and what happened in 1933. This document is a long document. It's, it's very um, um, comprehensive and I don't know how much of it we're going to cover. I don't want this thing to be an all-day video, but I've got to get you to understand a few things here. So now, I've given you enough that if you got on the internet and started searching right now, you could put this together for yourselves. But I'm going to take you through it because we really need to understand what's going on, why it's going on. Okay, and this is not all doom and gloom. 
Okay, this is reinforcing the point that Brandon and I both say you need to know who you are. You are a child of the Most High. You're under his jurisdiction. None of this really even applies to you, except it's going to apply to you in the physical sense that they're collapsing the economy, they're collapsing the food supply, and great hardship and judgment is about to come on this earth. However, Point two, if you align your life to the standards of the Most High, Yahuwah, and part three, depend on him, not yourself, and certainly not the state for your deliverance, you're ultimately, you will be in his kingdom, and, and you will be delivered from this. Even if your deliverance requires you forsake your life, you can be delivered from all of this. So I know none of us want to die. None of us want to go through the things that are coming, but they're coming, okay? I would like to tell you, you know, it's all, it's, it's all just going to go bye-bye, but it's not. It can't. It can't. It became a very somber thing for me today as I was going through this and, and looking at what's going on. And now I know why they can't back off. They can't. It all has to do with this principle of usufruct. Okay, and here we're going to get out of the presentation. We're going to drop this out, and we're going to go up here. I don't want this one right here. I'm going to go over to State of National Emergency. This is the website that I mentioned here. It's criminalgovernment.com, and this is, the, this is the address. I put it in the slides. <coughs> this is a, apparently, this is a 1974 document. I have not went and looked at the rest of their website. But there's some very notable quotes up here at the top. See, Mr. Speaker, we are now in Chapter 11. That's bankruptcy. Members of Congress are official trustees providing over the greatest reorganization of any bankrupt entity in the world history, the U.S. government. Now, this is Senator James Traficant Jr. from Ohio addressing the House United States Congressional Record, March 17, 1993. Do you see that? Volume 33 page H1303. Okay, here's another one. I have never seen more senators express discontent with their jobs. We have been accomplices to doing something terrible and unforgivable to this wonderful country. We have given our children a legacy of bankruptcy. We have defrauded our country to get ourselves elected. And then that is John Danforth, Republican Senator from Missouri, in an interview in the Arizona Republic on April 22, 1992. Okay, and you know, a thing is established by two or four, two or three witnesses. Well, there's two witnesses, and here's the third. We are bankrupt. We are insolvent on every level of our national life, whether it is corporate or whether it is just plain you and I out there with the life of debt that we have piled up, private debt, credit cards, and whatnot. But whether it is the government, we are insolvent. How long will it take before that nasty mega-truth is conveyed? This is Senator Henry Gonzalez of Texas speaking on national and international thievery in high places, United States Congressional Record, May 4th, 1992, page 8, 2891. So this is going to be the document that we're going to be looking at here in a moment. But before we go through this, I'm going to come right back over here. Did I bring up? That would be it right there, I believe. This is from... Um, Leave it. I want to. I want to stay here. Okay, 576. Gotta go back up to the top. So I can see. This is the obligations of usufructuary. Okay, the usufructuary shall cause an inventory to be made of the property subject to the usufruct. In absence of an inventory, the naked owner may prevent the usufructuary's entry into possession of the property. That is the key to the birth certificate. That's a warehouse receipt, and it has the inventory listed on it. And you're the inventory. The inventory shall be made in accordance with the rules established in Article 3131 through 3137 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Okay, now let's go back down here. and We're going to skip over a bunch of this. And I've forgotten, I've forgotten which one that I wanted to look at, which article it was. Okay. Okay. The usufructuary, this is why they have no choice. If they ever end the state of national emergency, they have to uh, 
restore all of our property to us, and they have to restore it with interest. That's called the usufruct. That's the law of usufruct. They are the usufructory, okay? They're the ones that have taken control. They've split the title into equitable title, which we're allowed to have, and the legal title stays with the usufructory. I know this is a little technical, but I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. The usufructory is responsible for ordinary maintenance and repairs for keeping the property subject to the usufruct in good order. Whether the need for these repairs arise from accident or force, majeure, the normal use of things, or, or his fault or neglect, the naked owner is responsible for extraordinary repairs unless they have become necessary as a result of the usufructory's fault or ne neglect, in which case the usufructory is bound to make them at his cost. And that's it right there. The use of fructory is bound at his cost. And that if we went through this, we would find a whole lot more that has to do with that. Um, expenses for repair and preservation. You know, there's there's so many things that have to do with this law of use of fruct. But basically what that means, we are the naked owner. Our estate is evidenced through the birth certificate. That is the inventory. This is the warehouse receipt. Okay? We are the naked owner, and the government is a usufructory. Now, usufruct means that they can benefit from the use of the thing, which is the rest of the estate, or the, the, the property of the estate. <coughs> they can benefit from that, but if they ever terminate the what caused this all to come into place, then they have to restore it, and they can never do that. They will never do that. So, we've gotten through that, and let's see if I'm going to go, before we go anywhere else, I'm going to just show you a couple of little quick things here. Um, federal Rules of Civil Procedure. This come from an act in 1934, but what I want to look at here is Rule 2. This covers, believe it or not, it covers criminal, civil, everything. They don't like you to know that when you go to court. I brought this up the last time I was in court, and the judge cut me off, wouldn't let me finish the sentence. So let's take a look at Rule 2, one form of action. There is one form of action, the civil action. Now, technically, there was a sequence of events that started with the um, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins case in 1938, where law and equity were merged. In reality, law and equity were merged with the, with the introduction of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And that was just implemented there. Now I'm going to show you one more thing about the, else about the courts. This is Supreme Court Rule 45, Process and Mandates. And I want you to notice one. All processes of this court issue in the name of the President of the United States. Okay, the Judiciary is not independent as it was supposed to be in the Constitution. The judiciary is a, another organ of the President of the United States. Rule 45 proves that. Okay, and Congress is just for show. We only have a president. We are under a dictatorship. We have been since technically since, um, oh, I can't remember the date, but it's 1861 when the nine Southern Senators walked out of Congress and there was no longer, they did not, they did not um, close down the session according to parliamentary procedure and they never had a quorum to start up a legitimate Congress after that time. But when we get up here into the things that we're going to look at in this document, it's all going to kind of come together, I hope. I hope. I said a little prayer before I started this because this is really, really taxing for my little brain. I'm not that smart, you know, to pull all of this together in a way that can make it understandable for you. Now this document I gave in the slideshow, I gave you this right here. Okay, I gave you where you can find it. And this document everybody should read completely. I don't know how completely we're going to read it because it's a long document. I mean, let's just go over here and look at this. I mean, this thing is, this is on and on and on and on and on. Okay, we're going we're gonna to look over quite a little bit of it here, <coughs> I think. And you can skip ahead to the significant sections. 
1933 emergency declared the purpose to abridge constitutional procedures and the method, license required to exercise rights. Now this is where, when you know who you are, that you're a child of the Most High, you're not a person, you're not a resident, you're not a taxpayer, you're not a voter, you're not a this, you're not a that, but you have to break those adhesion contracts. But really you don't. You really just have to declare your status. And that's what I'm trying to do, was trying to do, or show you how to do with my Declaration and Will video. And because once you put yourself back under the jurisdiction of the Most High, none of this applies to you. It really doesn't apply to us. However, we're at a point in time where they're going to ignore all the rules because, see, there's only two, uh, two systems out there. We've got the sentence of the Most, uh, the system of the Most High, of the kingdom of heaven, and we've got Satan's system, the beast system. Okay, the beast system right now is bringing everything to a head, and we know from Revelation, I believe it's in Revelation 12, that it's been given over him to make war against the saints. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to concentrate on keeping ourselves right and doing what we have to do. But I wanted you to understand why it has to happen the way it has to happen. Okay. So I'm going to read a little bit here. Um, well, I guess I'll start right here and just read a little and get, get us started. We're going to begin with a series of documents which represent, which are representative, exhibits one through seven, of the documents contained in this report. We will be quoting, quoting from, in many cases, reports, Senate and congressional records, hearings before national emergency committees, presidential papers, statutes at large, and the United States Code. Exhibit 8 is taken from a book by Schwister called Constitutional Development. Let's read the first paragraph. It says, We may well wonder, in view of precedents now established, says Charles F. Hughes, Supreme Court Justice, in 1920, whether constitutional government, as heretofore maintained in this republic, could survive another great war, even victoriously waged. Okay, how could this happen? Surely, if we go out and fight a war, and win it, we'd have to end up stronger than the day we started, wouldn't we? Justice Hughes goes on to say, the conflict known as the World War had ended as far as military hostilities were concerned, but was not yet officially terminated. Most of the war statutes were still in effect, and many of the emergency organizations were still in operation. What is this man talking about when he speaks of war statutes in effect and emergency organizations still in operation? Now we're right here. I think all the damnable heresies, oh, let's look back up. In 1933, Exhibit 9, Congressman Beck, speaking from the Congressional Record, states, I think of all the damnable heresies that have ever been suggest suggested in connection with the Constitution, the doctrine of emergency is the worst. It means that when Congress declares an emergency, there is no Constitution. And that's where we're at, and that's where we have been since 1933. So, this is the, the whole crux of this whole thing right here, is to understand that we are under the emergency. That in, in the international law and the Libra Code, different places, it's called the law of necessity. Okay? And when they consider that we're, we're in a state of emergency, anything they want to do is a necessity, and it justifies anything that they do in their minds. It doesn't. They've stretched things. They've, they've built this on logical fallacies when they, when they implemented all of this, and I just don't know if I can get this across to you. But I'm urging all of you to come back to this document and read it very carefully for yourself, and read it more than once, because this kind of tells us where everything came from and where it's going. Okay, this means death. It's the very doctrine that the German Chancellor invoking today in dying hours of the parliamentary bar body of the German Republic, namely, that because of an emergency, it should grant to the German Chancellor absolute power to pass any law, even though the law contradicts the Constitution of the German Republic. Chancellor Hitler is at least frank about it. We pay the Constitution lip service, but the result is the same. Now, back in 1933... Congressman Beck is pointing out that the Constitution already had lost all of its teeth. And it had done so through, originally, the Libra Code. 
okay? And through then emergency war powers. Okay, Congressman Beck is saying that of all the damnable heresies ever existed, this doctrine of emergency has got to be the worst because once Congress declares an emergency, there is no Constitution. Okay? He goes on to say, but the Constitution of the United States as restraining influence and keeping the federal government within the carefully prescribed channels of power is moribund, if not dead. We are witnessing its death agonies, for when this bill becomes law, 1933, mind you, it unhappily it becomes a if unhappily it becomes a law, there's no longer any workable constitution to keep Congress within the limits of its constitutional powers. What bill is Congressman Beck talking about? In 1933, the House passed the Farm Bill by a vote of more than three to one. Again, we see the doctrine of emergency. Once an emergency is declared, there is no constitution. The cause and effect of the doctrine of emergency is the subject of this report. In 1973, in Senate Report 93-549, Exhibit 10, the first sentence reads, Since March 9, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. Okay, now let's go back to Exhibit 9, just before this. What did it say? It says that if national emergency is declared, there's no constitution. Now let us return to Exhibit 10. Since March 9, 1933, the United States has been, in fact, in a state of declared national emergency. Referring to the middle of this exhibit, right here, the vast range of powers taken together confer enough authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional processes. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate the operation of private enterprise, restrict travel, and in a plethora of particular ways control the lives of all American citizens. Okay, now did you notice this? That this was, was this 1973, right here. Right here is where this, this quote came from. Senate Report 93-549 is where this, this comes from. Okay? So, if all these things are true back here, what's with all of the executive orders to Obama and Clinton and, and uh, most recently Trump? Trump has written more executive orders already than Obama wrote in two terms. And they all have to do with taking away rights and giving more power to the president in time of emergency. And now they're using this virus, alleged virus, as the ultimate emergency. And they're doing this social distancing thing because they don't want us getting together. See, Shakespeare said all the world's a stage. And it's, it's no more true than when dealing with our government and with our, our alleged leaders this is all an act. Congress is an act. Everything is an act. The president, since 1861, has been a dictator in the United States. If the people all ever got hold of that information and wrapped their minds around it, there would be revolution. Well, now, folks, we're at a point they're pushing for revolution because revolution allows them to implement a bunch of different things to completely annihilate us. And make no doubt about it, they have the means now. This, this 5G that's going in, that's military active denial weaponry. It's an inconvenience to them that there's 300 million guns in this country. But it's, it's like mosquito bites. Compared to what they have, they're 50, 75, 100 years ahead of us in technology. You know, we, we have no chance of prevailing now. The beast system is in control. And it's all, this whole playhouse is just about to burn down. So, and there's no stopping it. It's going to happen. That's why I'm saying, you know, it doesn't have to be doom and gloom for you. Just realize the truth of where we're at and, and realize that your hope lies in the Most High, getting your life right and following His sacred scriptures, following His laws. See, laws only apply to lawbreakers. If you're not breaking a law, it doesn't apply to you. Okay, and if you're, if you're conducting your life according to the Ten Commandments and 
there's other statutes and ordinances and things in there that, that, that apply to us also. But the basic moral law of the Ten Commandments, if you're applying that to your life, then you know, you're, there's, none of this is really applying to you. If you understand who you are and you're able to have the, the fortitude to stand in your capacity as a man or a woman, not a taxpayer, not a citizen. See, we're not citizens. The, the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven, and that's come, I believe that comes from Hebrews. I should have looked that up. But I didn't, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it right now. I was going to, but no. But um, we're registered in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to heaven, because the kingdom of God is going to be established on this earth ultimately. Okay, and to back that up, I will cite Psalm 115:16, which says, "The heaven, even the heavens, belong to Yahuwah, but the earth He has given to the sons of men." And Psalm 37 backs this up as does the um, Matthew 5, where it talks about the meek are going to inherit the earth. When has that ever happened? The meek inherit nothing. The meek are made slaves. They're sheep. Okay, but enough of that. Let's go back to our paper here. And this vast range of power, this vast range of powers taken together confer enough authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional processes. And under the powers delegated by these statutes, they delegate powers to themselves by the statutes. The president may seize, well, come on, may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, blah, 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 blah. And then they put all these executive orders in place because they're, they're putting on a show for us. It's like the, the battle, battle between Hillary and Trump. That was a show. I watched them after one of their most heated debates at a Knights of, Knights of Malta dinner. And they were laughing and joking together. And he had just told her, if I was president, you'd be in jail. And, and what's happened to her? Nothing. Nothing will happen to her. It's all an act, folks. It's all an act. So let's not be naive. And this situation has continued uninterrupted since March 9, 1933. In the introduction to Senate Report 93-549, Exhibit 11, a majority of the people of the United States have lived their, all their lives under emergency rule. Okay, this is from right here, 549, 1973. In 1973, everybody had lived under emergency rule. And what have we had since then? The war against drugs, the war against poverty, the war against terrorism, the war against this. That's why they keep calling it the war, because they keep reinstituting every year the president signs off on the Emergency War Powers Act and extends it for another year. And that keeps him in the position of dictator. Do you remember, any of you remember when Obama was talking about gun control, he said he didn't need Congress, he's got his cell phone and a pen? Well, that was, that was a very stark moment of truth that he put something out there like that. He doesn't need Congress because he was a dictator. Remember this report was produced in 1973. The introduction goes on to say, For 40 years, freedoms and government procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. Okay, that was 40 years of 73. Now from 73 to the present is how long? Do the math. The introduction continues. On the United States action taken by the governments in times of great crisis from at least the Civil War. See, here we go. Here we go. They're admitting it. At least the Civil War in important ways shaped the present phenomenon of permanent a permanent state of national emergency. But once again, they started out under the premise back in, uh, well, we were still under the Articles of Confederation before the Constitution was ever, ever commissioned and ever put into play. He started under the premise that, you know, we're free and we're going to exercise our freedoms and free ourselves from Britain and we're going to be the freest country ever. And they keep telling us how free we are. As they continue to tax us, as they continue to interfere with our lives, now they've got the whole country on lockdown. Come on, let's get real with this, folks. Okay, so... The introduction continues, and in the United States, actions taken by the government in times of great crisis have, from at least the Civil War, in important ways shaped the present phenomenon of permanent, a permanent state of national emergency. How many people were taught that in school? How could it, 
poss be possible as something which could suspend our Constitution would not be taught in school. Amazing, isn't it? No, it's not amazing. It's by design. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to start skipping through this because this will take all day if I read this whole thing. I would suggest you all go back to this link and you look this up and you read it because it all you don't need to wrap your mind around it all. Okay, we're going to go down and kind of read the highlighted stuff here because what happened, there's the Senate report. Um, that's talking about habeas corpus. Let's read the highlighted stuff because somebody has already done my work for me here. The actions, regulations, rules, licenses, orders, and proclamations heretofore and hereafter taken, promulgated, made, or issued by the President of the United States or the Sec Secretary of the Treasury since March 4th, 1933, pursuant to the authority conferred by sub sub Section B, Section 5. This is huge. Okay, this is huge right here. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Of the Act of October 6th, 1973, as amended, 12 U.S.C. Section 95A, are hereby approved and confirmed. March 33, 1933, 1 Title 1, Section 1, 48 Statutes at Large, 1, or 48 Stat 1. Now, what does that mean? Here, we got to pick up the narrative a little bit. It means that everything the President or Secretary of the Treasury has done since March 4, 1933, or anything the President or the Secretary of the Treasury hereafter is going to do is automatically approved and confirmed, referring back to Exhibit 10. Let us remember that according to the rec Congressional Record of 1973, the United States has been in a state of national emergency since 1933. Then we realize that 12 U.S.C. Section 95B is current law. This is the law that exists over the United States right at this moment. So we probably need to figure out what that is, huh? <coughs> If that be the case, let us see if we can understand what is being said here. Every action, rule, or law put in effect by the President uh, will be confirmed and approved. Let us determine the significance of that date in history. What happened on March 4, 1933? On March 4, 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated as President of the United States. Referring to his inaugural address, which was given at a time when the country was in the throes of the Great Depression, we read... Exhibit 16. I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that are stricken. Let me, let me scroll up here a little bit. I'm reading right here, if you're following with me. I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. These measures, or such other measures as Congress may build out of its experience and wisdom, I shall seek within my constitutional authority to bring into speedy adoption. But in the event that Congress shall fail to take one of these two courses, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask Congress for one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Here it is. Broad executive power to wage war against the emergency as great a power that could be given to me, in fact, if we were invaded by a foreign foe. Okay, so there's no army on our shore, but he's asking for war powers there. Okay, on March 4th, at his inaugural, at his inaugural, President Roosevelt was saying he was going to ask Congress for the extraordinary authority available to him under the War Powers Act. Let's see if he got it. On March 5th, President Roosevelt asked for a special extraordinary session of Congress in Proclamation 2038. He called for the special session of Congress to meet on March 9th at noon. And at that Congress, he presented a bill, an act to provide for relief in the existing national emergency in banking. And they always add this, and for other purposes. that They leave that in there. That's an enabling act for pretty much anything they want to do. Okay? And the enabling portion of that act, Exhibit 17, <coughs> excuse me, it states, Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. Oh, wow, they used the actual name of the country there. That was our original name. The Congress hereby declares that a serious emergency exists. <coughs> Exhibit 
and that it is imperatively necessary, necessary speedily to put into effect remedies of uniform national application. Sorry, folks, I had a coughing fit, and I paused this for a second. What is the concept of the rule of necessity referred to in the enabling portion of the Act as imperatively necessary speedily? That's kind of weird wording, but the rule of necessity is a rule of law which states that necessity knows no law. Oh, wow. A rule of law which states that necessity knows no law? That seems kind of oxymoronic to me. But that's, you know, that's one of the logical fallacies that they're building this whole thing on. A good example of the rule of necessity would be the concept of self-defense. The law says, thou shalt not kill. But also know that if you are in dire danger, in danger of losing your life, then you have the absolute right of self-defense. You have the right to kill to protect your own life. That is the ultimate rule of necessity. Well, you know, a lot of people lately have been asking me, you know, do I have the right to defend myself? Do I have the right to defend my family? I don't know. I'm going to refer you to the, to the sacred scriptures. You have to figure that out on yourself, for yourself. Um, there's, some, there's some verses in there on it, but I'm not going to weigh in one way or the other because that's above my pay grade. Thus we see that the rule of necessity overrides all over law. In fact, allows one to do that which would normally be against the law. So is it reasonable to assume that wording of the enabling portion of the Act of March 1933 is an indication that what follows is something which, prob which will probably be against the law? It will probably be against the Constitution of the United States, or it would not require that the rule of necessity be invoked to enact it. So, that's a, that's a good point he makes there. In the Act of March 9, 1933, Exhibit 17, it further states in Title I, Section 1, the actions, regulations, rules, licenses, orders, proclamations, heretofore or hereafter taken, promulgated, made, or issued by the President of the United States or the Secretary of the Treasury since March 4th, 1933, pursuant to the authority conferred by Subdivision B of Section 5 of the Act of October 6, 1917, that's the Trading with the Enemies Act, as amended, are hereby improved and confirmed. So, something happened here. This Act of October 6, 1917, the Trading with the Enemies Act, is being amended. March 9, 1933. What does that mean? Where we read those words before, this is the exact same wording found in Exhibit 15 today. Title 12, USC 95B. The language of Title 12 is exactly the same as found in the Act of March 9, 1933, Chapter 1, Title 1, Section 48, Statute 1. The Act of March 9, 1933 is still in full force and effect today. We are still under the rule of necessity. We are still declared in a state of national emergency, a state of emergency which has existed uninterrupted since 1933 for over 60 years. And now to that we can add quite a few more years because we've never left a state of emergency. As you may remember, the authority to do this is conferred by subsection B of section 5 of the Act of October 6, 1917 as amended. What was the authority which was used to declare and enact the emergency in this Act? If we looked at the Act of October 6, 1917, Exhibit 18, we see at the top right hand part of the page it states that this was an Act to define, regulate, and punish trading with the enemy and there it is again, and for other purposes. <laughs> they love that phrase. There's so many laws that have that, and for other purposes. It leaves it kind of open-ended so that they can interpret it. See, see, the Supreme Court, which is a branch of the government, by the way, um, did I show you this yet? I think I might have. Rule 45, processes and mandates, all process of this court issues in the name of the, presidents of the uh, President of the United States. The Supreme Court is an organ of the president, of the executive branch. It's supposed to be the judicial branch. And the legislative branch just rubber stamps whatever the president says. It's all an act. Those people sitting there in Congress, they do nothing. They're not needed. They can send them all home because the president's been running the country. And he has been since 1861. So now I've, okay, trading with the enemy. We're right here. Here's where we left off. 
By the year 1917, the United States was involved in World War I. At that point, it was recognized that there were probably enemies of the United States or ally enemies of the United States living within the continental borders of our nation at the time of war. Therefore, Congress passed this act, which identified who could be declared enemies of the United States. And in this act, we gave the government total authority over those enemies to do with it as it saw fit. See, so they took this in little steps. They got the power to do with the enemy what they saw fit here in 1917, okay? But also see, however, in Section 2, Subdivision C, in the middle, and again at the bottom of the page, other than citizens of the United States. Okay, and there's the rub, because when they come back in 1933, they get rid of that. They specifically excluded citizens of the United States because it was realized in 1917 that the citizens of the United States were not enemies thus were excluded from the war powers over enemies in this act. Section, well, let's go back up here a little bit, and we're right up here, right here. Section 5B of the same act, Exhibit 19 states that the president may investigate, regulate, prohibit under such rules, regulations as he may prescribe by means of license or, any, or otherwise, any tra transaction in foreign exchange, export, or earmarkings of gold, or silver coin, or bullion, or currency, transfer of credit in any form other than credits relating solely to the transactions to be executed wholly within the United States. Again, we see here that citizens and transactions citizens of citizens made wholly within the United States were specifically excluded from the War Powers Act. We the people were not enemies of our country. Therefore, the government did not have total authority over us as they were, were given over our enemies. Okay, let me scan this for a moment. So see, we were still protected. We were still protected by the Constitution at this point in time. And, but this is going to become crucial later on. Okay. I'm going to go back and read this. The distinction made between, let me, let me highlight so you can see where I'm at. The distinction made between enemies of the United States and citizens of the United States will become crucial later on. In Section 2 of the Act of March 9, 1933, Exhibit 17, Subdivision B of Section 5 of the Act of October 6, 1917, this is 40 Statutes at Large, 411, as amended, is hereby amended to read as follows. So now we're going to amend Section 5B. Let's see what it reads after that. During time of war, or during any other period of national emergency declared by the President, the President may, through any agency that he may designate or otherwise investigate, regulate, or prohibit under such rules, regulations as he, as may, as he may prescribe by means of licenses or otherwise, any transactions in foreign exchange, transfers of credit between payments by banking institutions as defined by the President, and export, hoarding, melting, or earmarkings of gold, silver, coin, or bullion, or currency by any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Now, what happened here? It, uh, it, they left out, the, they left out the, that it didn't apply to the people, the, or to the citizens. Let's read this. What just happened, as far as commercial monetary business transactions were concerned, the people of the United States were no longer differentiated. You see this right here? no longer differentiated from any other enemy of the United States. We had lost that crit critical distinction. Comparing Exhibit 17 with Exhibit 19, we can see that the phrase, which excluded transactions, excluded wholly within the United States, has been removed from the amended version of Section 5B of the Act of March 9, 1933, Section 2, and replaced with, by any person within the United States, or subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Wow. All monetary transactions, whether domestic or international scope, are now placed at the whim of the President of the United States through the authority given him by the Trading with the Enemy Act. Did you catch that? It, it's now, it's at the whim of the President. Okay. To summarize this critical point, on October 6, 1917, at the beginning of America's involvement in World War I, Congress passed a Trading with the Enemy Act, empowering the government to take control over any and all commercial, monetary, or business transactions conducted by enemies or allies of enemies within our continental borders. That act also defined the term enemy and excluded from that the, that
that definition, citizens of the United States. But then we see that they changed that in 1933, and they made the people. They put in this in instead, by any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Now this guy does a great scholarly work on this, and we could go through this, you know, for a long time and spend a lot of time on it, but it's not necessary. You already have all the information that you need. But I'm going to say you need to come back and read this for yourself. Um, through any agency he may designate or otherwise investigate, uh, prohibit under such rules or regulations as he pres may prescribe by means of licenses or otherwise any transaction with in foreign exchange, transfers of credit between payments, banking institutions, blah, 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 by any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof. So he's just made it all inclusive. He can do anything he wants to anybody he wants to at any time he wants to as long as he's declared a national emergency. It was officially declared on March 5th, I believe, 1934, or March 4th. Um, there was a whole thing, a whole bunch, March 9th. Okay, the act was made official. So I, the whole process started on March 4th, I believe, and March 9th, it was made official by Congress. It was rubber stamped by Congress, okay? That's all Congress really had to do. As you read down here, you're going to find that there's some congressmen that complained because there were, they only had a few hours and one copy to look over and had no chance to read the whole thing before they voted on it. And that's happened again. That happened with the um, Homeland Security Act. They got that just minutes before they were supposed to vote on it. And I believe it was Nancy Pelosi was the one that complained about that. Having to vote something and they haven't, they haven't read. But see, <clears throat> for the most part, Congress doesn't write the legislation. A congressman may come up with an idea. Then he sends it to an outside corporation that's hundreds of lawyers that write it all up. And then this senior executive services they've got. You know, they're people that are not even elected. They oversee all this stuff. And then they give it to Congress and say, okay, now you're going you're gonna to rule on this because the president is the one that's saying what's going to happen. Okay. Okay, this is really important. Now, there's some case law in here. Um, the Trading with the Enemy Act, originally as amended is strictly a war measure, as finds a sanction and provision of power in Congress, to declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and to make rules concerning captures on land and water. Now this becomes all important when you want to really understand this, but you don't really need to, okay? This is where they get the ability to have us have driver's license, building permits, all of that. We didn't have to do that. We never had to do that before. See, this is quite an involved document, and he's done an, an exhaustive explanation of this. Very, very comprehensive. Uh, okay, let's see. By means of licenses or otherwise, any transaction. But he gets down here um, by any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction. This, he just keeps covering this over and over ad nauseum because it is that that um, important. Okay. This is important here. We're going to look at this. We, again, clearly see there's, there's more to come, evidenced by the phrase, further measures extending beyond March 33, 1933. Could this be the beginning of a new deal, possibly a one-sided deal? How long can this type of action continue? Let's find out. Now, therefore, I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States of America, in view of such continuing national emergency and by virtue of the authority vested in me by Section 5B, of the Act of October 6th, 1917, 40 statutes at large, 411, as amended by the Act of March 3rd, 1933, do hereby proclaim, order, direct, and declare that all terms and provisions of said proclamation of March 6th, 1933, and the regulations as ordered issues hereunder are hereby continued in full force in effect until further proclamation by the President. And there you have it. Now, if we went back to Article 1 of the Libra Code, I don't think I pulled the Libra Code up. Um, no, it's not Article 1, but it's right, right close to it. Let's pull up Libra Code real quick.
There we go. I think this is it. Archives. It'll work. This is the one I pulled up last time. And there we go. Okay. A place, district, this is General Order 100, right here. Let's go back here. I'm going to pull up in a different format. Format. This is hard to read. Come on. It's the other formats. Here we go. Oh, where is the magnifier on this one? Here we go. Place District County occupied by enemy stands in consequence of the occupation under martial law of the invading or occupying army. Whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to its inhabitants has been issued or not, martial law is the immediate and direct effect and consequence of occupation or conquest. The presence of a hostile army proclaims as martial law. Do you think our, our police force is a hostile army? They go by military rank, rank and everything. Um, we have, have been under martial law since 1861, made official by this document in 1863. But look at number two. Martial law does not cease during hostile occupation except by special, whoops, that doesn't work, special proclamation ordered by the commander-in-chief or by special mention in the Treaty of Peace concluding the war. Neither of those things took place at the end of the War of Northern Aggression, as I now call it knowing what a SOB Lincoln really was. And here, until further proclamation by the president. When they take power upon themselves, they don't give it up lightly. And there's no reason to be believe that they're going to make things go back to normal. And this principle of usufruct makes it to where they can't. Because if they make it go back to normal, then they have to reimburse us for all of this bad spending policy that they've had for these umpteen trillions of dollars of federal debt that they put on us through Article 14 or um, uh, Amendment 14 of the United States Constitution um, for the United States of America, of United States of America. I can't, can't remember which one it was, the second one for the corporation, but it says that the public debt shall not be questioned. See, they covered all the grounds. And this was done over a long period of time. What was that? 1868, the 14th Amendment was allegedly passed, but it never was, really. It wasn't ratified properly. couldn't be ratified proper, properly because at that time there was no proper Congress. So it's just, Shakespeare was so right. All the world's a stage. We've been lied to, and the lie goes on and on. And I believe, with the research that I've done, and I can't prove it to you, but I believe that on the 13th of March of this year, I believe the international bankers um, repossessed the country. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that FEMA took control of the country at that time. Now, FEMA has to do with continuity of government. They say FEMA is there to help us. That's not true. FEMA is an organization that's supposed to make sure that the government of the United States will continue. It's a loaded game. The, the dice are loaded. The deck, the table's tilted. You know, everything about this is loaded against us. So, uh, let's see. Here we go. In the Congressional Record, March 9, 1933, Exhibit 38, we find evidence that our congressmen didn't even have individual copies of the bill to read on which they were about to vote. A copy of the bill was passed around for approximately 40 minutes. Congressman McFadden made the comment, Mr. Speaker, I regret that the membership of the House had, has had no opportunity to consider or even read the bill. The first opportunity I had to know what this legislation is was when it was read from the clerk's desk. It is an important banking bill. It is a dictatorship over finances. See this? Congressman McFadden saying it's a dictatorship over the finances of the United States. It is in complete control of the banking system. Of the United, in the United States, it is difficult under the circumstances to discuss this bill. The first bi section of this bill, as I grasp it, is practically the war powers that were given back in 1917. See, so the congressman, with just a, a cursory glance at this, saw the danger in it. Oh, it's, it's, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. But there's so much here that you, you need to go back and look at. 
And here's something that's important from the bill. The money will be worth 100 cents on the dollar because it's backed by the credit of the nation. It will represent a mortgage on all the homes and other property of all the people of the nation. You own nothing. You have been mortgaged to the hilt. From the time you came out of your mother's womb, you were mortgaged to the hilt and you were made the surety. And this here all has to do with the, the um, letters of prize and um, marquee how you take property during a time of war. Look here, this Senate report, this is the 1973 report, I believe. Um, if the president can create crimes by fiat without congressional approval, our system's not much different from that of communists, which allegedly threatens our existence. And here he says it's, it's an enormous scope of powers, a time bomb. Remember, this Congress's own document from the year 1973. Oh, and I'm not even going to go down this rabbit hole because this, this, this Agricultural Adjustment Act, you need to just read this all for yourself. Because if you go in the UCC, and I can't tell you, I can't quote it off the top of my head, you'll find out that we're all classified as animals and that our children are referred to as the unborn of animals, and that, that's how they get by with a bunch of stuff, because we're ignorant to it. We don't understand it. They didn't teach us, and they hide it. They hide it so good. Okay, here again in 1973, like a loaded gun lying around the house, the plethora of delegated authority and institutions to meet almost every kind of conceivable crisis stand ready for use for the purpose, for purposes other than their original intention. Machiavelli, in his Discourses of Livy, acknowledged that great power may have to be given to the executive if the state is to survive, but warned of great dangers in doing so. He cautioned, nor is it sufficient if this power be conferred upon good men, for men are frail and easily corrupted. Then, in a short time, he that is absolute may easily corrupt the people. So, I think we really went over enough of this. Um, well, this has to go. Um, I'm just looking here real quick. Okay, this is from the, in 1994, I'm going to read this. 1934, Congress passed an act merging equity and law, abolishing common law. This act is known as the Federal Rules of Civil Procedures Act. It was not to come into effect until six months after a letter of the transmittal from the Supreme Court to Congress. The Supreme Court refused transmittal, and the transmittal did not occur until Franklin D. Roosevelt stacked the Supreme Court in 1938. See, that's where the Tompkins Erie Railroad case came in. When you read Tompkins, and I've read it, there's Erie Railroad v. Tompkins, I've read it, and you don't make the connection, because this was used, it was used as a smoke screen for Roosevelt to stack the court and get the court to put this in. But here, let's go. But on March 9th, of 1933, the American people were declared to be the public enemy under the amended version of the Trading with the Enemy Act. What ju jurisdiction we were we, the people, then placed under? We are now the booty jurisdiction given to the district courts by Congress. It was no longer it was no longer be necessary of any value at all to bring the Constitution of the United States with us upon entering a courtroom, for that court was no longer a court of common law, but a tribunal. But look at this, but a tribunal under wartime booty jurisdiction. Take a look at the American flag in most courtrooms. The gold fringe around our flag designates admiralty jurisdiction. Okay, now, if you notice, lately, Trump has been standing in front of flags with a gold fringe. They're not even hiding it anymore. Nixon said something here. What's this? Continuing the reg regulation of the exports by virtue of authority vested in the president by the Constitution and statutes of the United States, including Section 5B of the Act of October 6, 1917, as amended, where the American people are the enemy, and in view of the continued existence of national emergencies. Wow. Under the authority vested in me as president, blah, 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 as amended. So they, they cite this all the time, and to remind us that they have absolute power over us. And truthfully, it's treason. Now, they did something in this Emergency Banking Act where they're supposed to prepay all the debt. And you don't pay debt. You offset and discharge. 
and I jumped over in this paper here it shows there's a section that shows that you don't don't own anything now this conclusion is very telling but it really doesn't apply to us if we attach ourselves to the kingdom of the Most High and if we walk in our proper status as men and women only don't be a sir don't be a mister don't be a citizen a taxpayer whatever then all of this stuff really does not apply to us however they have all of these ignorant order takers out there that are willing to you know do harm to you so there's going to be collateral damage among the people of the most high um, it, it's inevitable but you know there's nothing that they can do to us that the most high can't undo the thing is for us to guard always and to pray and as it says in the last verse in Luke 21 that we may stand before the Son of Man so anyway this is a very very telling doc document here um, I, uh, I think I went through the Hague conventions slightly I did put a slide on it uh, yeah see this all has to do with respect to the laws and customs of war and land and its annexes. And the whole thing, if you want to understand it, and here again, this is the International C Committee of the Red Cross, and they are confirming that, you know, this stuff is, is all tr true. Article 55, the occupying state shall be regarded only as administrator and usufructuary of the public buildings, real estate, forest, agricultural states belonging to, to the hostile state and situated in the occupying country. It must be safeguarded it must safeguard the capital of these properties and administer them in accordance with the rules of usufruct. Okay, and that's as far as I'm going to take this because I've gotten it very, very involved. And this gives me a headache. I read law all the time and it gives me a headache. And I imagine that those of you that have stuck with me to the end here have probably got a little bit of a, a swimming going on in your head right now. But please, please um, go to this document right here criminalgovernment.com look up this document and go over it look at some of these terms that I brought out go back to my go back to my slides here at the beginning and look at them you're an enemy of the state article 55 if they ever end it they gotta give everything back to you they can't that's why we'll never cease they'll never cease the hostility towards the people the Trading with the Enemies Act is the key. You revised in 1933. And this is the report, including the website. It didn't come up as a hyperlink, unfortunately. But this one right here, I'm going to go back and I'm going to start the slideshow and we're going to take a look at this and end on this note. Because this is not all doom and gloom. It may seem like it, the way I presented it, I'm not the best presenter. I do the best I know how. I said a prayer ahead of time because I knew this one was going to be a little heavier than I usually do. He said, I wish I had the skills of my friend Brandon because he's so good at this and, and I just feel so inadequate when I try it. But number one, you got to know who you are. I've stressed that from my very first video that I put out there. You have to realize that you are a man or a woman. Your children are not children. They are your sons and daughters. A man-child and a woman-child. You know, they, they have all these words of art. We don't even know what they are half the time. Even when they, we have their law books, we don't know what they are because they don't necessarily have them all in there. And they hide them in their statutes and codes. So go with what you know. You're a man, you're a woman, period. And you're a child, you're a son or a daughter of the Most High, Yahuwah Elohim. Align your life to the standards of the Most High, Yahuwah, and... Depend on him, not yourselves, and certainly not the state, for your deliverance. All the prepping in the world and everything, yeah, I've done some prepping. And I'm feeling like I'm, I'm getting a message I'm supposed to get across the Mississippi River and be on the other side of the river in very short order, and I'm not even knowing how I'm going to do it because, you know, we're, we're in dire financial straits here. But I'm depending upon him, not on myself. So there's going to be, he's going to make a way for this to happen if that's what he wants. But I'm not going to depend upon myself for my remedy. I'm certainly not going to depend on the state, on their stipend check, to deliver me. Because the fact of the matter is, they need to destroy us so they can get away from this rule 
of usufruct. So they don't have to give us back our property. And that is the end of the story, folks. Yahuwah bless you all. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope this comes across in a way that's beneficial to you and that you're blessed by it. I didn't mean to upset anybody or depress anybody. I'm trying to give you the information that you can see past and see that we are in the end times. And this is meant to be a message of hope, not of doom and gloom. So I pray that I pulled that off. But I'm not sure that I did. Yahuwah bless you all, and I'll talk to you next time.